So I think what we were going to follow up on was performance work was kind of the one pillar from the website that we hadn't gotten to yet. And the things that came up last time in relation to it were the, as far as the computer analogy, were like a operating system. And then we also just talked about performance work as the uh, doing it versus teaching it, or that there's more outward outward signs of what's going on with then some of the other topics like subtle or mental emotional work. And then uh, listening back on some of the older podcasts, something we want to get back to was uh, flow states. Cause I think that's uh, you've described that as a big part of the performance work that you do. So performance work, the reason I have tried to differentiate that as a, as a, certain categories because with with the dimension approach methodology you know again this idea of awakening versus healing versus personal growth or development performance enhancement those are different goals obviously and they all interrelate but they also have their their different aspects and when it comes to the performance of various activities, what I became more and more aware of was, was how much performance is determined by uh, the various things that I was working with. How much physical performance, for example, is, is affected by what's going on in someone's fascial tissue, what's going on as far as the tensegrity uh, situation in their body that's on the on the physical level on the subtle energetic level what's going on in someone's chakras for example is just huge with regard to not only physical performance but one's ability to perform functions of any kind because one's state one's mental state one's energetic state it is a huge factor you have to get into the right state to perform a certain function. If you're not in the right state, you're really uh, impaired with regard to performing a particular function. And for example, in sports psychology, you know, there's been a, a trend towards states, towards this idea of flow states or optimal states. But th- there's not a lot of kind of specific differentiation as far as these various physical, emotional, mental, conscious, imaginal states and what states correlate with what kinds of activities. So I've gotten real deep into that. Mental, emotional stuff obviously affects performance, whether you're talking about performance in a sport or performance uh, at work performance as a parent, performance in any creative endeavor you're trying to do. There's various concepts like like flow, like openness, like creativity, spontaneity, this idea of channeling, this idea of being in control of certain environments, being in control of yourself, in, cro- in control of your body, in control of your emotions, in control of your thoughts. These things are all huge, obviously, and when you look at at this stuff through the lens of witnessing, holding, containing, mirroring, it all it all comes down to those things. It comes down to what kind of where is a person orienting? Where are they anchoring? What are they identifying with? What lens are they looking through? What dimension are they paying attention to? The content of that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. In the same way that if you're working on your computer, if you don't have a sense of what window you have open and and have an ability to control, you know, opening certain windows and closing them and maximizing and minimizing, if you're just going by what happens to appear on your screen, you're going to be pretty lost, you know, and and if you got something maximized on your screen, that would be analogous to, to being in a state where where you're immersed in that particular dimension. And so it seems like that's, that's the all or that's the universe. 
And so you're trying to make heads or tails of that experience, that content. And if, for example, you're met with what seems like a hopeless situation in that window, it can be, you know, devastating or overwhelming and people, you know, can do all kinds of things in in reaction to that. When the truth is you don't have to win the battle in that window. You don't have to win the battle in that dimension or in that part of your psyche. Really what you need to do is not maximize that window in, in your mind, not maximize it with regard to it being the universe or it being self. And that sounds, you know, like a simple idea, but it, but we can get stuck in states, right? So I'm using the word state to mean orienting to anchoring in and identifying with those. Those are the three words I tend to use that correlate with states what dimension or what window in your psyche are you orienting from? What dimension are you orienting to, which would be anchoring? Which one are you identifying with? Has, has again, a, a massive impact on how are you going to hit that next golf shot? How are you going to do uh, in that next interaction you're having with your loved one? How are you going to do when you try to give that speech? We, we have these patterns, we have these reactions where we, in certain situations, we find ourselves in a certain state, you know, certain windows maximize on our screen. We lose touch with consciousness. If you use the computer analogy, consciousness would be, you know, the desktop or, or something where you, you're aware that, okay, the, the idea with a conscious awakening is, is that you become conscious of these windows opening and closing. And you can be aware that even if you have a window maximized on your screen, you know that, well, I just have that window maximized. That's not, that's not self. That's not universe. I just have it maximized. And there are other windows that exist that I could call up. So conscious awakening is, is sort of liberating yourself from just being thrown around from window to window and, and believing whatever is showing up. One of the things performance work involves is, is, is gaining a conscious control with regard to what activity are you trying to perform and what windows would you ideally bring up, right? What kind of state would you go into and, and how maximized uh, would those windows be? And of course, the more conscious you are, the better you're going to perform anything. So I'm, I'm looking at that, whether a person is wanting help with their golf swing or wanting help singing or wanting help relating. Any, any activity, we start looking at, in, instead of them just laying on the table or instead of them just sitting on the couch and kind of working with, with whatever comes up with regard to healing or with regard to growth, uh, instead, it's, we focus on what is the particular activity. To the extent they can in my office, we, they perform the activity. You know, they, they play their guitar, they run on the treadmill, they swing the golf club, they, they sing the song, and I watch them, and then we start working with it. I start noticing what's their pattern, what kind of, what's going on in their chakras, what's going on in their body, what kind of state do they go into, and then using the dimension approach, I, I start witnessing, holding, containing, mirroring, contacting in, in various ways to help them become more conscious of their pattern and or to help them find states, find dimensions that they would ideally find in order to perform the given activity. Do you have like an example of that, a more specific example of that process? Because it sounds, it sounds really interesting. And it's, it's kind of like how, how does someone end up seeing you for, I mean, is it like a referral thing? Like how, I mean, it's mentioned on the website, but it seems like a pretty specific, however universal, like a pretty specific thing to, to come in for. So kind of how does that happen? And then what, what's an example of that process? I mean, referral is the primary way that, 
that I get my clients in the primary way I've, I've gotten them kind of all along. Uh, you're not hanging out after a show saying you could use some work. Or no, I've, I've thought about it, but <laughs> you know, it's never, uh, I've never, it, my forte has never been marketing myself. So as far as like going to various venues and offering my services, um, I've, I've just recently started doing that a little bit with, uh, uh, the place where I do martial arts, the, the Academy is the name of it. And I've, I've offered my services to some of the, uh, instructors there. And so that's been a, uh, a fun experience, but, but that's fairly recent. So it's, it's mostly referral. And a lot of times what it's been is it's been a client that's been in for general therapy or general you know, some, some body ailment or something, but, you know, we've started talking about, oh, they, you know, they play golf or they run or they sing or something. And, and so then we talk about the performance side and it's, well, Hey, bring in your guitar, you know, or, or grab my guitar that I have here and, you know, let's see, uh, (laughs) let's see what you got. And, you know, it's, it's a fun exploratory thing, but it, but it's really been developing. Um, and, and people get really excited, you know, when, when I can help them, get a state shift and suddenly, um, feel, you know, like, like their voice will literally change, you know, they'll, they're, they'll suddenly feel an embodiment in their voice, let's say, or they'll, you know, they'll be able to open up their throat more because they, they're able to connect their consciousness to their throat in a way that's different than usual. And, and so they get more voice control or, uh, with golf, you know, it's like the, the person, uh, swings the golf club and I can see, okay, they're, they're not really getting much hip turn in their swing. And, and the, then the question is why, right? Cause back to the physical stuff, it's like people are out there practicing golf. They're watching golf instructional videos. They're paying for golf lessons and, and they're learning this idea of, for example, the, the correct golf swing no one's telling them that that they're actually not capable of doing the correct golf swing because their physical body for example doesn't have the mobility to make the actual move that the golf swing requires their fascial tissue is restricting them and and they can't do it and so practicing it and practicing it and practicing it isn't going to make it happen. They've, they've got to do something. They've got to make a compensation and do a different kind of swing that would be an abbreviated swing in some way. Or they've got to do something to get that fascial tissue uh, to change and get the overall tensegrity system to change. And, and it's this surprising thing that th- there isn't this awareness, you know, there isn't this knowledge that... that uh, the golf swing requires requires a certain amount of mobility in certain joints, and most people don't have that mobility. There, there's quite a uh, rotational mobility, for example, required to do a a golf swing that's that's correct. And again, most people don't have it, but you can greatly improve your mobility with rolfing with fascial work, with tensegral work, you know, or generally known as structural body work. Um, and then of course the other elements of it that I bring to it, as far as the subtle energetic component, the mental emotional component, all really being what determines the, the structural situation. Um, so again, to, as far as specific examples, you know, to have a person come in and swing the golf club and, and I'll, I'll point out that, for example, they start taking the, the the club back, the the club head back in the backswing, and they get about two or three feet back into the backswing, and then I'll 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 show them how really that's it. They're done. If they go any further back now, they have to start making a compensation in their spine, in their hips, um, because they their rotational capacity at the core hits its limit but they never even really realized this you know they just they just would make that compensation 
But now their whole swing is really messed up because the compensation they had to made, make pulls their head off line, you know, brings their arms into a different plane. And now they're, their body's in this funky position. They get the club head up to where it should be in the backswing, but they're in this funky position. And now they got to try to figure out how to get back down to the ball in any kind of, you know, accurate way with power. And, and it becomes this, this kind of uh, <laughs> ridiculous situation where, you know, the whole thing is, is just greatly compromised. But they practice it and practice it and practice it and there's a futility to it that's beyond just the normal futility of the game of golf in general. You know, the game of golf is futile innately um, as far as trying to master it, obviously. But, but again, people, uh, people spend a lot of time and a lot of money working on their golf game and not realizing that, that they've got a situation going on in their body that, that is literally prohibiting them from making the correct move it's not that they're not thinking about it right it's not that they haven't practiced it enough it's that their body literally can't do it their their vertebrae can't rotate the way they need to rotate their teres muscle can't lengthen the way it needs to lengthen their neck can't do the rotation the neck needs to do their ankles aren't able to do the rotational move or the, or the stabilizing move that the ankles need to do. And you compromise any one of those little things and the whole, the whole swing is affected. And so again, in the same way that, you know, golf instructors, instructors in any sport know, you know, the, these little intricacies, you know, if you, if you do this little thing with your wrists, um, or with your grip or, or something, you're going you're gonna to radically change your whole swing. In martial arts, if you, if you throw a right cross, your right foot needs to rotate um, in order to get the, the real power that you need to get. If you don't make that little move with your ankle, you don't get the power through your fist. And so there's these, you know, these correlations that are that are huge as far as one part of the body affecting the overall movement. Again, it, it's one thing to know that you should make that movement and try to make it. It's another thing to have your body literally not be capable of making the movement. So with these different sports, do you have to do research on your end to, to know what some of those motions should be? Or are you just observing the, the compensations? Or are you just observing the, the physical limitations that you see regardless of what the quote unquote correct form might be? Some of each. I mean, it, you know, it can be an activity that I don't know anything about. And then I can, I can work in, in the way I typically do where I'm, I'm feeling into it. I'm noticing energy flow or energy blockage. I'm noticing, you know, overall body movement patterns and, and, and I can just go from there. When I'm working with someone, of course, I start to study the particular activity, um, and have an interest in, in learning more of the, uh, the mechanics or the basics of that activity. But I can, I can do the methodology, even if I know nothing about the, you know, the actual, uh, you know, it's like with singing, I'm not, I can't tell you much about, I mean, I'm learning more and more, but for example, what register one is singing with or, or what key or what octave or what note, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't know music theory real well. I've been studying it a lot lately and have an interest in it, but, but at the same time, I'll see that, okay, you know, the, the person is, is, uh, for part of the song, they were present in their belly, but now when they went to a different part of the song, let's say where the where uh, they shifted into a higher uh, higher note, they get hung up up in their throat. And I can't tell you which note exactly or which key, but I can see what just happened. And so, you know, I'll point that out. We'll talk about it. Then I'll help them stay present and hit that note they were trying to hit and get the, res you know, the desired result. And, <clears throat> and my clients do a lot of teaching me, you know, the, if the client knows about singing, for example, 
which some of my clients do, you know, they'll be teaching me, well, that's this register, that's this key, you know, and we'll, we'll kind of be learning together. Oh yeah. When they sing in this key, this happens when they sing in this other key, they get hung up in this way. When they try to bring emotion into the song, this happens when they try to, if, if they're supposed to kind of bring some anger into the singing, they get hung up like this. If they're supposed to bring some sadness, they get hung up in this. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, in answer to your question, there, there's, there's a lot of both. You know, I'm, I'm quite knowledgeable about the golf swing. I'm quite knowledgeable about running form, quite knowledgeable about martial arts, somewhat knowledgeable about the mechanics of singing. But again, even if I don't know the activity, there's a, can still see what's going on as far as where are they consciously present, where are they not. There's a couple things. One, one you've talked about, uh, working with actors before, and I think we should come back to that. But there's one thing I wanted to ask about with this performance work. Do you see, and I'm, I'm not sure how to ask this question. So let me know if it makes sense, but the, we, people bringing patterns, cause you talked about, we have, you know, these patterns around performance, just like we have patterns around everything else. Do you see people using patterns in the wrong scenario? Or they're taking a, a pattern from their life or from their uh, from their psyche and applying it to the wrong situation. It's almost like a mismatched compensation. Yeah, no doubt. We have our we have our patterns. We have our lenses that we that we know and that work well in a lot of situations. And then we we try to look at at every situation with that lens and and we don't realize we're doing it. It just seems like it's the, the way, <laughs> you know? And, and so, yeah, that happens a ton where we we're in, we're experiencing, we're interpreting and we're behaving via a certain pattern and running up against conflict. And then of course it's, there's just frustration that ensues and, and we get caught not not even knowing, you know, that, that we're operating from a certain program, so to speak, and that that program is not really suited to the to the situation that's that's at hand. Yeah, definitely. I think I was just I was thinking about trying to swing the golf club well, but you tie your shoes too tight. So it's like a physical example of the wrong pattern, but. Also, there's the mental, emotional patterns where you you bring how you feel about something totally unrelated to the performance you're trying to do. So not like, I mean, there's being distracted, but I think it's also like the, an unconscious pattern in your mental, emotional state that you bring to the performance. Yeah, it's it it that's huge, obviously, as far as. I mean, it's kind of like everyone knows that. And I guess like when you're working with somebody, how do you differentiate those things from correcting the physical form? So we've talked about the the whole inner game series where, you know, performance is equal to potential minus interference, right? And so we have these compensations that are interference. We have these mental emotional states that are interference, uh, just another like way of framing the the idea some of the ideas you're talking about but the i think it's it gets back to for me it's like how do you toe the line between helping and and as you've said it whatever comes up comes up but helping someone improve their performance without going down the road of totally deconstructing who they are as a person <laughs> yeah there is that part no, it's good though. It, 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 I mean, that is a big because uh, it's the same with with uh, <laughs> with anything. Yeah, with it, do. right? It's a uh, it's a running joke, you know, with a lot of clients. Like they came in because their knee was kind of sore, and two years later, <laughs> they're in. You know, we're still working, and they're in the throes of like deep existential issues, and it's like, you know how far do we have to go here before my knee feels better? And, 
you know, if it's a deep enough pattern in their psyche that sometimes that's the case that the, that if the, you know, that that knee problem really is that deep seated and, you know, and it's, and it's showing up that knee symptom is, is, is literally just a symptom of this very deep pattern. Other times, you know, their knees hurt for 20 years. They come in and after one session, their knee feels better and it seems like a miracle. And so there's just this huge variance. So yeah, there's always looking at, okay, what, you know, what's the person's real goal here? How many sessions are they really signing on for? And, you know, what can we make happen in that amount of sessions that's going to be, that's going to be productive? And, and so there's certainly trying to work, work with a person's pattern. One of the sort of safeguards, if you will, around that is, is again, this idea that I'm just working with what's up in the moment. We're not trying to somehow deep dive into layers of a person's psyche that they aren't already wrestling with. And because of that, there tends to be, you know, generally speaking, this, this upward curve as far as performance and as far as how they feel. Now, there can be obviously some, some uh, fluctuations in that, and a person can feel worse for a time as, as we're going. But generally speaking, it's, a, it's an upward movement because of the way that I intentionally work, which is, again, to, to look at what's, where are they at right now, what's happening, what's the pattern, and let's bring some consciousness to what's happening now. And when you bring consciousness to what's happening now, there's something very safe in that. There's something that's kind of honoring that's honoring the person's defenses, honoring their boundaries, honoring their patterns, honoring their identity, honoring their, the various place they look at life from. It's not about attacking it. It's about helping them see it. My job isn't to tell them they're wrong. My job isn't to tell them they're right. My job is to accurately see what they're saying, what they're being, what they're uh, behaving, to accurately see it, which is to witness it, to accurately receive it, which is to empathize, to provide a validating feedback loop, which is to mirror. Validating doesn't mean they're right, doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means it's indeed their experience. And, and to reflect it in a way to where they become more conscious of what it is they're doing, what it is they're being, what it is they're thinking, what it is they're feeling. And again, when in working in that way, the person is honored and, and they're, making, they're making the changes. If changes are to be made, their system is deciding the change. I'm not going in and, and rearranging wires or or doing surgery or reprogramming, I'm helping them see here's what's going on that they weren't, uh, maybe weren't seeing. And then again, their own system makes any changes that, that their system decides to make. And so there's a real, again, a real safety in that, a real honoring of boundary and a systematic change process that that honors their overall pattern. That was kind of a new, not new, but a good summary of that process. I think we've, we've called it like co-creation before or, but just in this context, it makes a lot of sense of a, an idea that we've talked about before. Yeah. I think that piece of it is, is an important piece for people to, to hear about and to know because it's, I think it's one of the big, you know, th- there can be a lot of abuses out there with, you know, with, with various types of work. And, and it's, a, it, it's a barrier to entry with a lot of this stuff because people, you know, will kind of fear being messed with 
in a way that they don't really, you know, th- there's a big trust. There, there's a lot of trust, obviously, in any kind of work, meaning the client has to trust the practitioner, whether you're being, you know, taught a certain skill or whether you're getting a massage or whether you're going through a, a therapeutic process or a healing thing. It's, there's a, uh, the nature of, of, again, of all this stuff is that where we need help is where we're unconscious. And where we're unconscious, we are vulnerable, you know? We're in the dark. And so it's scary to allow someone else to interact with us in a way that is going to impact our overall system especially in areas where we where we don't feel very conscious and and again my specific approach is to is to not try to work i'm not working on the person's unconscious i'm bring i'm helping the person bring their consciousness to where they were previously unconscious and i think with the with the physical Part of it, it makes that process more clear that this in the same way that the way you work with fascial tissue isn't the way you used to, that you're not like with rolfing where you're physically manipulating that tissue, you're not really doing that anymore because you're helping the person become aware of it and change those patterns and change where things are being built up and where they're not. And so you're doing the same thing with mental, emotional, subtle imaginal consciousness work that you're helping the person become aware of these things and change those and providing obviously a container that they wouldn't have elsewhere uh, that can help facilitate that. Yeah, totally. That's a, that's a good point with the tissue stuff. It kind of makes it easier to understand the, the difference between, between the two things and the interrelation. Like you wouldn't like go to a therapist and have them drill into your head. You know, like there's right. a, there's a, obviously like there are more, I don't know how to say there are more violent ways of going about these things that aren't especially helpful and don't result in the person becoming, uh, self-sustaining, you know? Yeah. It's really, it's really tricky because if the nature of all this stuff that, that I'm talking about involves unconsciousness versus consciousness, I'm, cl- I'm claiming to varying degrees to be able to see the unconscious territory in someone else's system and then trying to help that person see it. And so it's like, well, wait, aren't I diving into then? Aren't I going past where the, what the person's presenting to me consciously? Right. And isn't, is that some kind of boundary violation or is that some kind of, uh, invasion or something. And the way I'd try to speak to that is that, is that a, we're all doing that all the time. There's no way to really not because you see what you see. You know what I mean? You, if you notice that, geez, someone seems pretty angry and they're going, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. (laughs) And you're like, okay, well, it seems to me like there's anger there. Um, you know, it's like, it's hard to just not see it then. Right. Or if you see them, you know, swinging the golf club in a way and it's like, you know, you see that their ankles are doing something weird, but that person's not aware of their ankles. It's like, well, are you, are you violating their boundary by noticing that in their ankles? There's no way to only see, only be aware of what that person's consciously showing you. There is the idea of, okay, what, you know, we all do this with, with each other. It's like, you know, is it, is it safe? Is it appropriate? Is it going to be productive right now to, to mention to my partner, you seem kind of angry today or, you know, you seem, uh, I, I think, I think you're, you're saying this and doing this, but you know, it's, it seems like there, it, there's some, uh, there's some sadness there that you're kind of, you know, defending against or whatever. And, and, a, and a, You know, we make these decisions moment to moment, like, what do I actually speak to? What do I actually reflect? 
what do I empathize with versus what do I kind of avoid or pretend I don't see or much do I confront this person right now versus just let it go. And, and there's a real art to that, obviously, that we're all engaged in, in any kind of relating that we're doing. Obviously, in my practice, people are coming to me and they are, they're, they're asking for help with a certain thing. We, we, you know, I take very seriously what it is they're saying they're here for, what it is they're wanting help with. I, I do a lot of explaining what I'm doing and why, how I'm working. And, and we, you know, we maintain a very open dialogue as far as what's coming up for you. Um, and, and where do we want to go? And, and I, you know, I often, or, or I could even say always can see layers that we're not going to, you know, that, that we're not ready to go to yet, that we can't get at yet, that the person doesn't want to get at. And so there's a real, again, a real honoring of that and, you know, nuance to that. And, you know, it's a, it, it's a process. It, we're, all, we're all in this process. Again, we're all doing the dimension approach moment to moment or we're not. And, and, uh, so we're all engaged in this, in this, okay, how, you know, what am I aware of? What do I, what do I see happening? Can I witness that? Can I empathize with that? Can I hold space for that? Or, or do I react to that? Can I mirror it? I know I say it over and over again, but we're all doing these, these activities or we're not with any given experience moment to moment we're either being present with it or we're not we're either holding space for it or we're not and and what i'm doing in my practice is just being extra intentional about that so there's a way that it's like in a certain way it's 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 definitely can be a deep dive and really challenge a person but but again my my sense is life is challenging this person's pattern every freaking day anyway, you know, like we're all, we're all in our pattern and we're all at war with reality because we're trying to have reality match our pattern instead of adjust our pattern to match reality. Helping someone become more aware of their pattern is really aiding them in their overall situation. Even if, even if within the therapeutic context, they can start to feel like it's, you know, the therapist or the practitioner is, is the problem or the practitioner is challenging them in a way that is the therapist's fault in the same way that our partner challenges us, right? Freud had this figured out that, that as intimacy and trust increase, regression increases. And regression meant more and more unconscious processes surface and we and we start attributing our unconscious processes our unconscious rage our unconscious terror our unconscious desire etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. we just start attributing it to the thing we're interacting with and we start thinking that it's that thing's fault for better or for worse you know that it's it's relational work if i'm if I'm helping someone's calves um, lengthen out and get less tense, it's a relational process, you know, with their calves and with that person. It's not a mechanical stretching or, or pulling on tissue. It's, it's that I got to relate with that person in a way that helps them relate better with their calves. And what they're going to come up against is the reason they stopped relating with their calves, which just all sounds kind of kind of corny, but it's it's how it works. If you want to learn more about the Dimension Approach, please visit dimensionapproach.com. dot com.